We started a new message series last week, and it's called Stranger Things. And many of you are probably familiar with that series on Netflix. And no, we're not preaching on the Netflix series, but we are talking over the next several weeks about Stranger Things, and we hope that you come back and be a part of that. We started that off, and we kicked that off last week, um, and, and what it is is a study in the book of Acts, because the book of Acts gives a record of the time that Jesus uh, rose from the dead, and, and as he's ascending into heaven, it records the... the a description of the early church, the New Testament church throughout the lives of the uh, earliest apostles. And so last week we started it with it, taking a look at something called casting of lots. And this week we're picking up uh, on, on that same series with something that's recorded very early in the book of Acts. But we really have to back up a little bit before the book of Acts. And what we, what we need, need to start with is where all four gospels end. Because all four gospels end with the fact that um, after Jesus was, was crucified, early on the, on the third day, on Sunday morning, a couple friends of Jesus, a, a couple women, came to check on the body of Jesus, and they also came to put perfumes and spices on it, because by the time they brought Jesus down from the cross on Friday evening, um, the the, the uh, Passover or the Sabbath had started, and, and they were unable to to really uh, address Jesus' body the way that they wanted. So very early on that Sunday morning, they they approach the tomb, and as they approach the tomb, there's some strange things that are going on because as they approach that tomb, they see that there this giant boulder that had been placed at the mouth of the tomb uh, had been moved, and the tomb was opened. And as they entered into the tomb, they saw something strange as well. And like his body, Jesus' body wasn't there. And as they turned, they saw even a stranger thing because there was suddenly an angel that said, he's not here, he's risen. As soon as they heard this, they, they ran to where the other disciples were and they shared with them what had happened, these strange things that they had seen, but the disciples didn't believe it. They needed to see these strange things for themselves. And so they rushed to the tomb and they see that, in fact, his body's not there. And scripture tells us that over the next month or so, the next 40 days, Jesus would make appearances to his followers. And that's where the story picks up in the book of Acts as our stranger thing this morning is the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension. Look with me at Acts chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. Now, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to them, and he gave many convincing proofs. He was proving to his followers that, in fact, he was no longer dead. He rose from the dead. He gave many proofs that he was alive, and as part of that, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he would speak to them about the kingdom of God. Now, on one of those occasions, while he was eating with his disciples, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait here for the gift that my father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John is baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and they said, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore king the kingdom to Israel? Is it at this time that you're going to restore power to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times and the dates that the Father has set by his authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud ultimately hid him from their sight. And as they were looking intently up to the sky where he was going, suddenly another strange thing happens. Suddenly two men that were dressed in white stood beside them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? 
for this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you've seen him go into heaven. What a strange thing. Can you imagine what it would have been like? What would we have done as you're sitting there and Jesus is talking to you and suddenly he just begins to elevate, levitate, and, and ascend into heaven before your very eyes? How would you respond? What's interesting when I read this text is, is how the disciples respond because they respond in exactly the way that you would expect that, that they would have responded in seeing that. In fact, they responded in a way that Dr. Newton said, things happen. Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion is this. For every action, there will be an equal and opposite reaction. The action was they saw the risen Lord. The action was they had conversations with the risen Lord. The action was that they saw the Lord literally ascend into heaven. And if that's what they saw, you can't help but have an equal and opposite reaction. And this is what I want to talk to you about this morning. What is our equal and opposite reaction to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead? And because I'm here to tell you this, that the disciples, in fact, for the action of Jesus rising from the dead and ascending into heaven had an amazing equal and opposite reaction. And I want to share with you like Jesus' 12 disciples and also the Apostle Paul, I want to share with you exactly what that reaction was to the action of Jesus ascending before their very eyes. Let's start with Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wasn't even one of Jesus' original 12 disciples. The Apostle Paul wasn't there when Jesus literally ascended into heaven, but the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee who was one of the biggest persecutors of the church who didn't see Jesus resurrect, didn't see Jesus ascend into heaven, but he heard Jesus call down to him from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And from that, the, the, this Pharisee that was killing and arresting the Jews became one of the biggest promoters of, uh, uh, of the message of Jesus Christ, who literally walked thousands of miles across several missionary journeys, spreading the message of Jesus Christ until in Rome in 66 AD under Nero, he was beheaded and killed. Because you see, for every action, there must be an equal and opposite reaction. Now let's get to the rest of, of Jesus' disciples, the original disciples. There's Peter. You know the story of Peter. He was one of the closer disciples of Jesus. Peter, like Paul, ends up dying in Rome in, in, under the persecution of Nero. But for Peter, he dies two years before Paul. And, and Peter doesn't die by beheading. Paul gets that because he's a Roman citizen. Peter's not, and so they decide they're going to crucify Peter. But you know what? Peter did not feel it worthy to be crucified. That's how Jesus died, and, and, and so he insisted that he'd be crucified upside down. And then there's Peter's brother, Andrew. Andrew actually dies about four years before his brother, Peter. Andrew takes a message to Turkey and to Greece, and Andrew, too, is, is crucified, but Andrew, like his brother Peter, did not consider himself worthy to be crucified, to die in the same manner Christ did. So rather than being on a cross the shape of a T, he's crucified on a cross the shape of an X. Then you got James, the son of Zebedee. He was put to death by the sword in Jerusalem very early on, 44 A.D., then you got his brother, John. Now, John's unique. He's the only one of all the, all the disciples that it's believed he did not die a martyr's death. He actually died as an old man, exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And then there's Philip. Philip takes the message to North Africa and to Asia Minor. Philip actually leads the proconsul's wife, to believe in Jesus Christ, and as retribution for doing so, he was killed. 
Then there's Bartholomew. Bartholomew took the message to India and Ethiopia and Southern Arabia. And in India, he was cruelly beaten and he was crucified. And then there's Thomas. Do you remember Thomas? Thomas was the one that didn't even believe Jesus was resurrected. When he heard it, he said, this doesn't make any sense. He said, unless I put my fingers in those nail marks in his hand, unless I can touch where they thrust the spear in his side, I won't believe. Thomas goes and he takes a message to Syria and India, and in India, he dies murdered with spears. And then there's Matthew. You remember Matthew, the tax collector? He takes the message to Persia and to Ethiopia. He's killed in 60 AD with an instrument I had never even heard of called a halberd. It's basically a pole that has an ax on one side and a spear on the other. And then you got James, son of Alphaeus. He took the message to Syria, but when he was preaching in Jerusalem, he was put to death by the Jews, stoned to death. And then there's Thaddeus, also killed by the religious leaders. And then there was Simon the Zealot that took the message to Persia. Simon the Zealot was sawed in half because he would not bow down and sacrifice to the sun god. And then there's Matthias. He's the last of the disciples. He's the one we talked about last week. When Judas killed himself, he was replaced with Matthias. Matthias was stoned by the Jews in Jerusalem and then beheaded. Now, what's crazy about what I've just described to you is if you think back to when Jesus was arrested, what happened? All of his followers went and hid. There's only one who followed him, and he stayed at a distance, and it was Peter. And if you remember the story of Peter, he follows at a distance, and then three different times before dawn on that night that Jesus is arrested, Peter's accused of being an acquaintance of Jesus, and Peter denies it. And then after Jesus is crucified, Peter joins the rest of the disciples, and they're literally hiding in fear of their life. And I want to ask you, how do you go from denying Jesus and running and hiding for your life to being willing to walk hundreds of miles across the known world at that time and to die all gruesome deaths? What changes? And what takes place? They saw the risen Lord. They spoke to the risen Lord. They ate with the risen Lord. They saw him ascend into heaven. And for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I can't help but wonder what's happened to the church. Where has the conviction gone of the church that we see amongst these earlier followers of Jesus. Where's the courage in the church today? Where's the direction in the church today? These guys walked hundreds of miles and and were willing to stand up to persecution and painful deaths for what it is that they saw and what it is they believed. That's not what we see in the church today. In fact, I was disappointed and frustrated to see this, but I uh, wouldn't tell anyone about this ahead of time in case any of you had any ideas. But there's a church that's starting up in South Fort Worth that was putting out on social media that they were given like a Mercedes or a BMW away today on Easter. Why? Because really the message of, of Jesus dying on the cross and rising again and ascending into heaven, that's not good enough. We got to supplement that with like a new vehicle. That will bring people in. That, that's what the church has become. And the church is, is willing to see just about anything to get people to, 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 to come to church. The church is, is unwilling to address the, the failings of society that we live in because they're afraid of offending the people. What has happened to our conviction? What has happened to our courage? And what has happened to our direction? You know, and I think there's two reasons for this. And the first is this. The church has gotten distracted. The story that I just shared with you this morning about the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, like you don't hear that talked about a lot in the church anymore. Maybe on Easter you'll hear it, but we don't talk about the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. We don't talk about it all the time. In fact, you know what we talk about? If we're going to look at the biggest church in America, this is what the biggest church in America talks about just about every week. How to live a blessed life. 
And so we've replaced the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ with it being about you and how it is you live a blessed life. And we wonder why there's no courage. We wonder why there's no conviction. We wonder why there's no direction when we've made the message about us. And then I think this is the other difference. If we're going to be honest, we didn't see it with our own eyes. The disciples, the early disciples of Jesus, they literally saw him come to life when he was dead. They literally had meals with him. They literally talked to him. They literally saw him go to ascend into the skies. And we, can, we know the stories, but we only read about it. We only hear it, and it's not the same thing when you read about it. It's not the same thing as you hear about it. If I said to you yesterday, I heard that someone died in a car accident or was hit by a car out front of the church, we would all be like, wow, that's horrible. If we walk out here this morning and we see it, it would be tragic. We wouldn't be able to get that image out of our minds. There's something different about seeing it. And I guess in fairness to us, we, we didn't see it like they did. We just hear about it. But you know what? We might not have been there to see Jesus rise from the dead and ascend into heaven. But we have all experienced the result of it. And I think if we truly understood what it means that he rose from the dead, I think we would have a lot more courage and direction and conviction than what we do. Because this is what it means. That because Jesus rose from the dead, we who are dead have now been made alive. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and you were dead in your sins. You know, even when we read that, I mean, what does that mean to be dead? Because none of us, we don't know what it's like to be dead. I mean, we know people who've died, right? But we're told that we were dead in our sins. What does that mean? Well, a dead person, they have nothing to offer. They, 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 they're nothing that they can do. They're not existent, right? Like, if, if you're a poor person, you have something to offer. If you're a poor person, you got a little bit you can offer. If you're a dying person, you still have some advice that you can give, some testimony maybe in your final breaths as you give encouragement to people when you're dying. But we weren't poor. We weren't dying. We were dead in our sin. But even though we were dead in our sin, Scripture tells us that God made us alive in Christ Jesus. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. But because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us what? Alive with Christ when we were dead in our transgressions, for it is by grace that you have been saved. If we truly understood that we were dead, but God made us alive, I wonder if our reaction to the action would be a little bit different. Why did God make us alive? It wasn't because he thinks you're amazing. It's not because of, uh, uh, of your giftedness. It's not because of all the wonderful things that you do. God made us alive, Scripture says, because of his great love for us. And because of Jesus Christ's resurrection, the dead have come to life. And I have to tell you, that's an amazing concept if you think about it. The dead have come to life. In fact, in a crazy way, God gave this to us as an illustration just a few months ago, didn't he? Because just a few months ago, towards the end of the NFL season, we literally saw the dead come back to life. If you remember the football game, it was the Bills versus the Bengals, and, and the Bills' safety, DeMar Hamlin, he got hit in just the right way. You saw it, he stood up, but as quickly as he stood up, he died. 
in front of everyone's eyes, in front of 80,000 people that were watching, in front of millions of people who were watching on TV, in front of the football players, they, they saw him dead on the ground. In fact, they, they couldn't stand to watch it. You remember the shock on their faces. Some had to turn away. Some were like wiping away tears. The, the game got canceled, but, but in the midst of all that, literally on that field, the dead came back to life, and that was amazing. And it caught everyone's attention, the nation's attention for quite some time. If it's that amazing for, for someone to be dead maybe for a minute or two and be brought back to life, how much more amazing when Jesus, who wasn't dead for a minute or two, he was dead Friday night. He was dead Saturday morning. He was dead Saturday afternoon. He was dead Saturday night. And very, very early Sunday morning, he's still dead. But early Sunday morning after that, suddenly that cold body begins to warm. Suddenly the heart starts beating again. Suddenly the chest starts going up and, and coming down. His eyes open. He sits up. He stands up and takes off his burial cloth. And with the brush of his arm, that stone moves to the side. And in that moment, we who were dead in our sin have been made alive in Jesus Christ. If that was the action, what must our reaction be? If when Jesus came to life, so did we. You see, it's got to be so much more than just getting a special dress because it's Easter. It's got to be so much more than... than, than hiding some Easter eggs or a chocolate basket or, or maybe that spiral ham dinner we're all looking forward to when we leave church today. It's, it's got to be like uh, experiencing from death to life ought to come an amazing sense of gratitude. What's got to come is a changed life. Almost a year ago to within a couple weeks, my son was packing up the apartment that he had lived in for his first couple years in Vanderbilt um, in Nashville. And uh, he was going to be moving back into the dorm for his senior year. Uh, first couple years because of COVID, he lived in an apartment. But so he had to get all that stuff out of his apartment, load it in the car and bring it home. And it was going to be hard for me to get out to Nashville to help him to do that, to do that move back. But my brother lived um, just a couple hours away. And so I asked my brother to, uh, if he would mind going up uh, a couple hours into Nashville and to uh, help load up Matthew's apartment and, uh, and pack it up in the car and, and, and so he can drive back. And he was like, no, happy to do it, no problem. I told my son, I said, uh, when Uncle Mike and you finish uh, doing all that, be sure to take Uncle Mike out for a good meal and put it on my credit card. Uh, I really appreciate that he's helping you out that way. Now, they didn't actually go out for a fancy meal. They went out for some, um, you know, Nashville, Tennessee barbecue. And my son, as he was sitting there eating and talking to my brother, took a bite into his pulled pork sandwich when it became lodged in his throat. And not too long, my brother noticed that my son was choking. And my brother had grown up in the, in the food industry or, or worked in it his in, entire life. And um, my brother's a very uh, large man. And, uh, and so immediately, my brother knew what to do. And he jumped up, and he started to uh, give my son the Heimlich right there in the middle of the restaurant. And the way that my son described it and my brother described it, my brother, who once again is a very big man, thrust it into my son's abdomen probably like six or seven times and nothing came loose. And my son said that he was starting to black out and my brother told me that he was going to try, as he told the story, he had decided he was going to try a couple more times and after that he was going to just start breaking some ribs. And then when he went back and he did it another couple times, finally it, it dislodged just enough that my son then was able to get a little air in, went to the bathroom and, and got sick. And the way that my brother describes it, the whole restaurant stood up and clapped for him. When my 
brother and son told me that story, I wanted to get sick. And I can tell you this, that my son will be forever grateful to my brother for saving his life. I will be forever grateful to my brother for saving my son's life. If, if I'm forever grateful to someone who saved my son's life who wasn't even dead, but was working towards that, how much more should our response be to the one who took us once we were dead and made us alive again? The Bible tells us what that response should be as we continue with what Paul says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. And God raised us up with Christ, and he seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that at the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork that is created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared for an advance for us to do. What must our reaction be for the fact that God took us from death to life? Well, our reaction must be this, that we must, like, be forever changed by that encounter, that we must have a gratitude that is beyond all measure, and that ultimately we would respond as the Apostle Paul tells us that, that we should, that, that we would do those good works that God has created in advance for us to do. Here's what's interesting, and what's interesting to me about the story that I'm sharing with you today. You see, it's in the reaction that you can see the importance of the action. Let me say that again. It is in the reaction that you see the significance and the importance of the action. It is in the reaction of the disciples and the apostles that we can understand what it was that Jesus actually did. If you buy your kids a donut, you would expect that the reaction to that action is, thanks, mom, thanks, dad. If you buy them a car, I think it should be something a little greater. What is your reaction to the action of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. It's got to be more than a ham dinner. It's got to be more than a dress or an Easter basket. It's got to be a life change. It's got to be willing to uh, leave behind this worthless way of life we've all known and to do as Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. You know, we live in confusing times. We live in wicked times. And we shouldn't be surprised by that because the Bible says that the closer that we get to those end times, things are going to become exceedingly wicked and exceedingly confusing. And I have to tell you, like, what has taken place in humanity over the last 30 years compared to the rest of all humanity, it's, it's mind-blowing. Because everything's been turned upside down. Morality has been redefined. Gender has been redefined. Right has become wrong. Wrong has become right. You even have the shooting in Nashville, and you're hearing just as many people call out sympathy for, for the transgender shooter than, than for the Christian children that were murdered, and that is the world in which we live. And, and once again, it's just a confusing time and a wicked time, but here's the frustrating thing is, is the church is just going right along with it. We're supporting it. We're encouraging it, and at the very least, we're just keeping our mouths shut. What happened to our conviction? What happened to our direction? In the end, once again, it stems that I don't think we really realize what the, resur the, the resurrection of the ascension means. I hope this day that you understand the significance of what Christ has done for you. 
that you were dead, but then you were made alive. I pray to God that you get that. And I pray to God that the church would get that again. And I pray to God that, that, that like as Christians in the church, we would just have a tenth of the courage and the direction that, that Jesus' disciples did who saw his death and resurrection with their own eyes. Just a tenth. Because you remember at the start of this story, this same Jesus that ascended to heaven and they watched go, suddenly there are two men, two angels that said, you know what? In the same way that he went, he's coming back. And I'm here to tell you, he's coming back. Will you be prepared for his return? You know, there was a saying that was always said, we will know they are Christians by their love. And I will challenge you with this this morning. You will also know that they're Christians by their reaction to that action. Because for every action, there must be an equal and opposite reaction. And I ask you this day, what is your reaction? What is it today? What will it be tomorrow? And what will it be for the rest of your life? Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Almighty God, we just thank and praise you for this day. And gracious God, in many ways, maybe it's a bit difficult because we read about it and we hear it, but we weren't there to see it. I thank you, gracious God, for the reaction of the early disciples that help us to understand and see what the action was. And I pray for all of us that are listening today, gracious God, that we would understand that we were dead in our sin. But as that breath of life came back into the lungs of your son, Jesus Christ, you made us alive again in him. We thank you for that amazing gift. And we pray, gracious God, that we would every day, show gratitude and show our confidence in that message by the reaction to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.